Now, um, what I'm going to talk about is um, a, a particular aspect of, of research into responding to misinformation. Uh, and I'm going to draw upon several different um, lines of research and reports, one of them being an excellent um, guide that um, Angus was part of putting together, the Vaccine Misinformation Management Field Guide. And th that um, guide takes a holistic look at how all the different aspects of developing a program to counter misinformation. Um, and I think you will hear from the, the uh, different speakers uh, today addressing uh, different parts of these four sections. What I'm going to be looking at is um, focusing on the fourth phase, the engage and, and developing responses to misinformation. And uh, in particular, my research focus has been um, uh, using a branch of psychological research uh, called inoculation theory. This is a, um, a, a line of research dating back to the 1950s that takes the idea of vaccination, obviously a uh, concept that everyone here will be very familiar with, but applies those principles to knowledge. What um, psychology researchers have found is that just as um, exposing people to a weakened form of a virus builds up immunity to the actual virus, I'm hoping I'm getting the science there right because I'm not a medical expert. In a similar way, um, psychology researchers have found through decades of experiments that uh, exposing people to a weakened form of misinformation builds up um, resilience or immunity um, to actual misinformation. Uh, so that if the people are inoculated against misinformation, they're less likely to be misled um, by the misinformation. So um, what do I mean by a weakened form of misinformation? There are essentially two key elements to an inoculating message. The first is warning people of the threat of being misled. And secondly, providing counter arguments that explain how the misinformation is wrong. And there are really two main ways of achieving this, of explaining how the misinformation is misleading. And those two ways, are one term uh, used to describe them are fact-based and logic-based. Fact-based inoculations or corrections um, demonstrate to people how misinformation is wrong by explaining the science to them, explaining the facts, giving them factual explanations. Whereas logic-based inoculations or corrections um, explain how misinformation is misleading by pointing out the logical fallacies or the rhetorical techniques uh, used by the misinformation to mislead. Now there's some um, excellent research uh, um, published by uh, two, uh, I think they're both European-based um, researchers Philip Schmid and Cornelia Betch, who have explored both these approaches. Um, I will note, however, that they call fact-based um, um, inoculations or corrections uh, um, topic-based, and they call the logic-based technique-based. Researchers like to use their different terminologies, um, but it's, it's the same thing. It's either explaining the facts, the science, versus explaining the misleading techniques. Now, in their research, they were debunking various different myths about vaccination, and they tried uh, different techniques um, or different approaches to debunking the misinformation. Um, the technique rebuttals or the um, logic-based rebuttals uh, explained uh, various logical fallacies that were used within, um, within the misinformation, some of them including um, the fake expert strategy, um, false logic or logical fallacies, conspiracy theories, impossible expectations, and selectivity, otherwise known as cherry picking. Um, alternatively, they uh, also debunk the misinformation uh, by focusing on topics like specific um, aspects of, of vaccination and, and the misinformation related to these, these topics. What the researchers found was that either approach was effective, um, both explaining the facts and also um, 
uncovering the rhetorical techniques in misinformation were both effective in, in um, neutralizing the misleading um, effects of misinformation. Uh, but uh, they also, uh, in the end, argued that because technique rebuttals or explaining the misleading techniques in misinformation could work across topics, um, they advocated that was a, a quite a powerful way of, of addressing misinformation. In other words, once you explain a specific um, fallacy or rhetorical technique, uh, even in a specific instance, um, that, that can potentially inoculate users um, across other topics that use the same technique. Uh, now, I don't have a slide for this, but I found this in my own research. I, when I inoculated uh, participants in an experiment against the fake expert strategy, uh, which was used by the tobacco industry, I found that that same technique uh, used in climate misinformation was no longer effective. So without even mentioning the climate misinformation, I was able to inoculate people against it by inoculating them against the same technique in, um, employed by the tobacco industry. Now, um, so my work, given this powerful um, generalizability of uh, logic-based rebuttals or technique-based um, uh, inoculation, my work is focused on um, logic-based inoculation and exploring um, more effective ways to put this into practice. Uh, and the first step is um, building out uh, the vocabulary, the, um, a, a framework for describing the different techniques used in this information. Um, I've, the, the five techniques that um, Schmidt and Betts used in their paper, uh, because I, I need acronyms to remember things, uh, I found it really uh, useful to, to summarize those five techniques using the acronym FLIC, fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking, and conspiracy theories. And over the last decade, I've gradually been building up a taxonomy of different, um, different rhetorical techniques, different logical fallacies. And more recently in um, work that I published with Stephen Milandowski, um, traits of conspiratorial thinking. Now, this is a lot to take in and, um, and I'll come back to that, that challenge um, that in order to effectively inoculate people against misinformation, they have to kind of internalize all of this, um, this information, all these different techniques. Uh, that is a big communication, education and psychological challenge. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to one way that I've explored overcoming that challenge later on. Um, but first I wanted to give you some examples of taking this approach uh, and even combining the fact-based approach and the logic-based approach in responding directly to COVID vaccine uh, misinformation. Um, I think it was earlier this year, it was not that long ago, maybe it was late last year. Um, uh, I, Stefan Lundowski uh, lead authored this uh, communication handbook um, addressing uh, misinformation and, and just general communication principles um, for engaging with the public about uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And in this handbook, uh, there's, there's many pages of very useful information. I highly recommend checking it out. And the short URL is in the bottom left corner of this slide. One section looks at how to respond to specific um, myths um, about COVID-19 vaccines and I think vaccines in general. And the approach we take is both a combination of the fact-based approach and the logic-based approach. We explain um, a, the relevant facts um, to each of the different myths that we debunk. But then we also explain the fallacies that each myth commits. Um, and ideally, uh, debunkings, corrections that, that incorporate all these elements, fact, myth, fallacy, are a, a, an effective way to um, respond to misinformation. Trying to have your cake and eat it too, basically, explaining the facts as well as uh, 
incorporating some critical thinking into, into the communication as well. So I do recommend um, looking at that resource as well. Um, lastly, I wanted to, well, not lastly, but uh, next I wanted to talk about um, some research that I've, I've um, been conducting with two of my colleagues, Sajan Kim at George Mason University and Emily Braga at the University of Minnesota. We've been uh, exploring different ways of, of um, practically um, employing logic-based corrections. How do you most effectively explain the fallacies in misinformation? Um, both Sojung and Emily both do a lot of work in health misinformation. So um, it, it isn't just Angus that has been pulling me into uh, uh, researching vaccine misinformation. Uh, Sojung and Emily have also been um, um, tugging me in that direction as well. Uh, and so one study we did experimented with both um, humorous and non-humorous, more conventional uh, approaches to explaining misinformation, uh, explaining the fallacies in misinformation. Uh, and interestingly, we also, while we were running these experiments, we were using eye tracking equipment to monitor what people were looking at while they were reading uh, the misinformation and, and the corrections. And here are the two, here are two examples of the types of corrections that we were doing, as well as the misinformation. Um, we were looking at um, HPV vaccines. The reason why was because we were using university students as our, um, as our participants. And uh, this was the, the misinformation that seemed the most relevant to them. Uh, and then we uh, uh, either used a non-humorous or humorous correction. Here's the example of the non-humorous, basically using an infographic to point out the um, fallacy in the misinformation. Uh, the other type of correction we used was a, um, a humorous one. And in this case, we use um, a technique called parallel argumentation. Um, parallel arguments basically take flawed logic into misinformation and transplant it into an analogous situation. Um, and usually an, an extreme and absurd, but a concrete example is, is a way of taking that abstract logic and making it more concrete and relatable to people. Uh, and so in this case, the panel on the left here in this cartoon has the original argument. And then the panel on the right has the same logic but applied to a more ridiculous situation. Although my wife pointed out that some people actually do believe that what they wear at sports games influences the results. So she questioned whether it was the example was, was uh, sufficiently absurd. What we found uh, was collecting eye track, tracking data as well as um, conducting survey questions after people were looking at our different corrections. Um, we conducted mediation analysis, which is basically a statistical way of looking at um, how what was what was the mechanism that made the correction effective. We found that both corrections were effective in neutralizing the influence of the misinformation and reducing the credibility of the original misinformation tweet. Uh, and using mediation analysis, we were able to better understand what the mechanism was that made the, um, the correction effective. Was it the credibility of the uh, correction? Was it, was it by reducing the credibility of the misinformation? Or was it the amount of attention paid to the correction tweet? We found that with the non-humorous condition, the the critical thinking deconstruction that pointed out the fallacy, that had a higher credibility relative to the humorous correction. And it was that credibility that mediated the, um, the effectiveness. In other words, the mechanism that made the serious uh, correction effective was its increased credibility. In contrast, the humorous condition was perceived as less credible but it attracted more attention. People spent more time looking at the cartoon uh, and, and even reading the tweet 
the, the text that came with the cartoon. And it was that increased attention that uh, mediated the, um, the debunking. Um, and another interesting thing we found in our survey data was people were more likely to share or comment on or retweet um, or like the humorous condition. So while both approaches were effective, the humorous one was more likely to go viral and be shared and be seen by more people. Uh, and so I want to come back to a point I made earlier. Um, the, the techniques, the landscape of techniques of misinformation is big and this taxonomy that I'm showing here is not even comprehensive. Um, I continue to add to it on a regular basis. Um, and so that is a communication challenge. How, not only do you, how do you get people's attention about this content, how do you explain it all to them? And then how do you get them to internalize it so that they can use it in practice in, in the real world when they encounter misinformation? Uh, and so I just want to give you or introduce to you a project that I've been working on that, that attempts to resolve this and other challenges um, inherent in this problem of trying to inoculate the public against misinformation. There are two challenges that I've been concerned with for, for many years. Um, I've known for a long time that inoculation is a powerful tool to countering misinformation but I've struggled to come up with answers to these two questions. Firstly, um, how do you overcome the psychological barrier uh, that by inoculating people against misinformation, you're essentially trying to turn them into critical thinkers. You're trying to get people to slow down and assess arguments, uh, trying to uh, spot fallacies or rhetorical techniques. And this, goes against the very hard wiring um, of our human brains. Um, human, human brains are, um, they really have two main ways of thinking. And this, there's a lot of research into um, this dual mode of, of thinking, um, but the book by Daniel Kahneman, I think explains it in a really accessible way. Uh, he talks about fast thinking and slow thinking. Fast thinking is our in instantaneous um, reactions to, to stimuli, to any, you know, to making decisions throughout our daily life. And fast thinking is effortless. It, it just happens without us even really thinking about it. The other type of thinking is slow thinking. And this is reasoning through difficult problems, um, such as trying to do a two by two multiplication, you know, trying to two digits by two digits, so that kind of difficult uh, calculation or trying to um, assess the logic of an argument to see whether it contains reasoning fallacies. Slow thinking is cognitively effortful. And because of the difference between these two types of thinking, the vast bulk of our thinking is fast thinking. Now, it's hard, it's very effortful for us to do slow thinking, we can do it, but we don't often do it. And so this is a challenge for anyone looking to inoculate the public against misinformation. How do you get people to do more slow thinking, given how difficult it is to do that? Um, and certainly it's the goal of every educator to try to encourage slow thinking amongst, amongst their students, their classes. But what is really interesting is in Kahneman's book, he also talks about a third type of thinking which he calls expert heuristics. And expert heuristics are um, quick responses that experts make um, uh, in response to complicated problems. Um, but it's the kind of um, qualified expert response that, uh, that an expert can make because of all their years of experience and practice. It's like a heart surgeon assessing a very complicated situation in the middle of surgery and making an instant decision because of their years of experience. Um, basically, um, practice, repeated practice can help convert slow thinking tasks to fast thinking responses. Um, and that process or that 
kind of fast thinking response is uh, through practice is um, expert heuristics. Uh, and so that thinking on that dynamic um, leads me to the project that I've been working on as a way to try to resolve this, this psychological barrier to inoculating the public. Uh, and to solve that problem, I turn to gamification. Um, the project that I've been working on is a game called Cranky Uncle uh, that Angus mentioned earlier. And in this game, the goal of the player is to become a cranky uncle themselves, as in a science denying cranky uncle. And um, the way this game works is uh, you essentially get mentored by this cranky uncle cartoon character who explains all the different science denial techniques to you so that you can implement the techniques yourself and get crankier and crankier as you play the game. And the denial techniques that the game lists uh, are the five techniques of science denial, flick, and then all the sub logical fallacies and rhetorical techniques um, throughout that taxonomy. So what happens in this game is as you look at different denial techniques, Cranky Uncle explains them all, and then the game uses cartoon analogies or parallel arguments in cartoon form to make the logical explanations more concrete. Um, uh, more relatable. Uh, but then the important element of the game uh, is not just introducing and explaining the techniques of science denial, but also getting players to practice spotting misinformation by showing multiple examples of misinformation and giving players that task of identifying what is the denial technique in the misinformation. What the game is doing is getting people to practice critical thinking. And the more they practice it, the more the game uses all the common gameplay elements that incentivize a player to get further and further into the game, collecting points, leveling up, competing with uh, friends or classmates. Uh, the further they get into the game, the more they convert that slow thinking task of spotting fallacies into a quick thinking expert heuristic. The goal of the game is to make critical thinking quicker and easier. Uh, and the other challenge with um, inoculating the public against misinformation, particularly um, misinformation on polarized topics, and as someone who focuses on climate change, this has particularly been an issue. The problem is the way social media and even uh, mainstream media in the form of like cable channels um, the, the media landscape now is so fragmented uh, that um, the result is that the people receive information that conforms to their existing beliefs. Uh, we see this especially with social media platforms. The business model of social media platforms is um, likes, uh, clicks, um, retweets, all those interactions uh, are what generate revenue for the platforms and people are more likely to like and interact with content that they agree with. And so social media platforms deliver information that already fits in with people's pre-existing beliefs. So if I have like the perfect inoculating message to debunk you know, a particularly damaging myth about vaccination or climate change or whatever, um, and I need to get that into a specific community that's vulnerable to that misinformation. Um, if the social media platform isn't going to um, deliver that information because it doesn't conform to their beliefs, that is a big challenge um, for, for communicators, scientists, educators, anyone trying to get this information to the communities that need it the most. So how do we solve this issue of, of siloed communities? Uh, over the course of developing this game and talking to scientists about the content, I quickly realized that scientists who teach classes were, I was bowled, bowled over by how enthusiastic they were to use a game like this that introduced critical thinking to students in an engaging, interactive way. Educators are crying out for, um, for interactive exercises that engage their students. 
Uh, and so that motivated me. I, I quickly saw that um, the classroom is, is one of the most effective ways to reach uh, um, a broad um, spectrum of the community. And that motivated me to develop a teacher's guide to make it easier for educators to use uh, this critical thinking game in their classroom. Uh, and uh, it was only a few months ago that we started uh, promoting the game to educators, uh, just on social media initially. Uh, and to, to my surprise and delight, I already found that educators across the US, as well as in a, a dozen countries around the world, um, have already started using the game uh, and using it in both um, conservative as well as liberal parts of the country. Um, I, I think uh, you're probably already thinking of the question like, will the game be available in other languages outside of English speaking countries? And we are currently working on a multilingual version of the game and volunteers have already offered to help translate the game into, um, so far we have about a dozen different languages lined up to get translated. Uh, so once we overcome the technical problem of making the game multilingual, certainly those translations will be coming along and, and then we expect to see that the game will be used even in more, even more countries than a dozen countries already. Um, and so I just uh, wanted to finish off by just um, uh, discussing what, what we're planning to do next after this first version of the game has, has been publicly available for several months. I've been talking to Angus a lot about the um, prospect of expansion packs in the game. In other words, um, having specific sections, adding sections to the game that address specific issues. Uh, uh, and of course, Angus is especially interested in having a vaccination section within the game. Currently, the game is, is just about misinformation in general. Uh, but I think that um, um, adding social elements uh, is uh, one of the most powerful ways to reach more people and help the game go both go more viral and engage players at a much deeper level. And so we're hoping to incorporate player versus player contests down the track when we can uh, obtain some funding for it. And lastly, uh, the game is very good at inoculating people against misinformation and building their resilience. The one thing it doesn't do yet is teach you how to have difficult conversations with people who, who might um, have objections or be hesitant about issues like vaccination. Uh, and so what my hope is that we can add another character as well as Cranky Uncle, maybe a cordial cousin who can explain the different techniques that people can use to have those kind of, kinds of difficult conversations. I'll leave it there. Um, and I'll, anyone who's interested in having a look at the game, uh, it's freely available on both iPhone, Android and browser. Um, I uh, hope you can all have a look and, and uh, feel free to uh, reach out to me um, if you have any questions about it. Thank you, John. I must say, I mean, this is exciting for me. I mean, we're finally getting to things that might actually be working. John, there's, there's some there. So there's some evidence out there to show that this can actually work at scale. Um, I think there's another game that's been tested in a, in a couple of studies that I might ask you to speak to um, uh, because I, I think it's interesting for us to start to understand that this can actually be shown, you know, we can demonstrate that this can, this can work. Um, also, if you could speak a little bit to um, the idea of scaling, for example, in the classroom. So we have, we have um, you know, a study that showed that uh, a critical thinking curriculum in schools in, in Uganda in a cluster randomized trial had a, a really significant impact on, on um, the student's ability to identify misinformation. Um, we've got Finland, right, which is the, apparently the country the most resistant to misinformation, which has been doing this within its, its national curriculum for a while. Could you speak a little bit to um, maybe some of those some of those results and whether you're looking at um, how you might measure um, with, for example, Cranky Uncle, the, the impact on, on people's resistance to uh, misinformation. Yeah, um, so firstly, um, 
uh, going outside of my game. Uh, there's work by John Risenby and Sandra Vanderlinden who developed uh, several different games. There was Bad News, there was um, Harmony Square. Oh, Bad News was about fake news in general. Then they developed a game with the US State Department called Harmony Square, which was about misinformation targeting elections. And then they developed the Go Viral game, which was about COVID misinformation. And um, certainly they've published many studies on the first two games that have measured the efficacy of the game and shown that it does increase players' resilience against um, misinformation and fake news. Um, I'm not sure whether they've published any research on Go Viral yet. It's probably, the game is so fresh that it's probably coming down the pipeline, but the game uses the same model as their first two games. So I'm pretty confident that they'll find um, that those games are effective. Uh, and, and those games really inspired partly the approach taken in Cracky Uncle, which is inoculation, but an active form of inoculation. Uh, in other words, most types of inoculating messages are passive. You're communicating information in a one-way direction uh, and the audience is passively receiving those inoculations. Games uh, are a more interactive, um, active form of inoculation. And, and as Sanders research has shown, uh, they're quite powerful. Um, we've done some pilot testing with the Cranky Uncle game, um, just using a, a um, prototype version of the game back when we were first testing it and found that um, the game was, a, was effective in increasing resilience uh, or in, more specifically, was effective in increasing players' ability to spot different types of fallacies and misinformation and across a whole range of different topics. So it wasn't just about climate, wasn't just about vaccination. We used examples of misinformation across multiple topics um, and found that uh, even with this fairly simplistic prototype, the, the game was effective, built player resilience against misinformation. Uh, as for classroom interventions, um, uh, we've, we've touched on this, we've done developed lesson plans and implemented them in the US, although it was on climate, um, it was on the topic of climate change rather than vaccination, but that principle um, still applied. And we developed lesson plans that combined explaining the facts of climate change with these critical thinking elements of explaining the fallacies that misinformation employed to distort the facts. Uh, essentially, every lesson was that fact myth fallacy structure. And we found that, yes, it did increase their science literacy. They were better at understanding facts. Um, but it also, and this is the interesting thing that I was keen on exploring um, from a research point of view, it also increased their confidence to talk about the issue. Uh, and that's uh, in the inoculation research. Uh, scientists call this uh, phenomenon post-inoculation talk by uh, equipping people with the counter arguments against potential misinformation actually empowers people or, or um, uh, builds their confidence to be able to talk about potentially difficult subjects. Uh, and that, that has a viral effect too. Inoculations can essentially spread from people to people um, mm. by giving them this uh, inoculation, this post inoculation talk effect. So to, so to continue the vaccination analogy, <clears throat> what, what we've shown is that, that we can not only potentially, you know, have mass immunization programs against misinformation, but if we do it right, we can actually equip people to then immunize others. <laughs> it's almost like, you know, giving someone a vaccine and then giving them a few doses to go and give to their family as well, to take home <laughs> and give to their family. And that touches upon... Um, a question we've got from Bipin Adigari, um, which I think is a, a really interesting question. So is there any evidence that, um, uh, the, the, you know, education systems can actually affect the level of critical thinking in a population? <clears throat> and I did mention the Finland example. Um, Finland has had critical thinking in its national curriculum, I think, for close to a decade. And they emerge um, consistently as the country the most resistant to misinformation. But Bipin also asks, what are your recommendations to policymakers? And 
I might make a quick comment here, John, and then hand off to you. I mean, I think what we're getting at here is, um, uh, you know, it's it's great to have a game, and it's great to have your game translated into um, a number of languages. But the 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 guide that you've developed for teachers takes us to a, a different level of potential um, uh, implementation, you know, through an education system, for example, and. Um, for me, I think we're at a point now where we have to start getting policymakers thinking very, very seriously about making very serious investments in um, obviously kind of the managing the acute problem that we have right now with the with the infodemic, uh, with this wave of of misinformation, but also over the long term building levels of um, immunity within a population to misinformation. By, by, by really doing this properly, by really investing in, in the science and, and expanding on the work that, that you and, uh, and others are doing, but also then thinking about um, how that would be implemented at scale. Do you have any thoughts about taking this to scale? Um, I guess my, my main response to the recommendations to policymakers question, uh, um, I think that this, this question will be uh, addressed more thoroughly by the other speakers. Uh, one of my earlier slides showed those four aspects um, of, a, of a holistic comprehensive program. Um, uh, and, and the inoculations was really just that fourth final step. Um, and, and I think the other speakers are going to be looking at the, the other sections of those four sections in more detail. So I think that um, yeah, taking a holistic approach to misinformation is, is important. Um, and that involves, you know, the social listening aspect, um, being aware of it, working with content experts to develop um, robust responses, and then working with social scientists to, and educators to to deploy um, responses. So, uh, yeah, that's a, it's a bit of a loosey goosey answer, but I guess people will be getting more tangible um, recommendations throughout this panel. And that's a great introduction to our next speaker. We've got a couple more comments. Um, I'll go quickly to them, but um, we are about to move to exactly what John's been referring to. So how, how do we um, set up systems that allow us to um, be able to hear the conversations, uh, detect the misinformation? Because um, if we don't know what uh, the concerns and questions that um, communities have, are if we don't uh, know what kind of misinformation is circulating, then we can't necessarily address it. <clears throat> However, the exciting part of your, of your work, John, is that you've shown that you can inoculate people against misinformation in general. And even if they're, you know, if they've played the game against um, it, looking with examples of climate change, we can imagine that that may give them the tools <laughs> to, um, to detect and, and potentially um, develop a level of resistance to vaccine misinformation. I think that's very exciting about this work. Um, there are two questions here. I'll, we've got one more minute. Uh, uh, Sherlock Lai, I'm gonna leave your question till the discussion at the end. Um, risk communication is a big topic. Uh, there are many things that we know about how to explain, uh, how we should be explaining very low risk. So let's, let's tackle that at the very end. Um, but very quickly, Nina Castillo-Carandang says, um, what would you suggest to combat misinformation amongst communities where there's low levels of literacy and potentially, um, you know, uh, communities that are, that are digitally disenfranchised that don't have access to the, to the internet or to smartphones? John, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, now I can't speak to my direct experience, but I have, I've been monitoring closely what uh, John Rosenbeek and Sander van der Linden have been doing with their, um, with their games and their, their various interventions. And a, a really important element of their work, which I'm very impressed with and like, would like to em emulate down the track, is working with local groups um, you know, in local communities in different countries uh, to, to take their generalized content, their logic-based inoculations or whatever you want to call it, and make it um, relevant and resonant with local populations. So I think that um, it's about finding good allies, local teams who have inroads to local communities and um, 
the communication practitioners who, who understand how to how to reach in their own communities. Um, that's hard work. Like it would be lovely if we could just create a single game and it will work for everyone equally. But uh, unfortunately, we do have to do that hard work in building teams and customizing our responses to, to different contexts. Thanks, John. We really do have to do this hard work. And I think uh, if there's one um, positive angle to this pandemic, it's that hopefully policymakers and, and the funders will start to recognize that if we don't invest to the level that we've invested in, for example, uh, in vaccine supply and distribution, <clears throat> if we don't invest to the same level, right down as, as you touched upon, John, to the community level um, in, in uh, vaccine uh, engagement, public engagement, uh, communication, um, strategies like this to, to inoculate uh, communities against misinformation, we're going to be stuck in this ongoing cycle um, uh, forever. And so I'm hoping that one thing that will come out of this webinar is perhaps an increasing awareness amongst some of the people who have access to those decisions um, that we need real investment in this work. Thanks very much, John.